All right, Wednesday night we were talking about, <clears throat> yes, I still have my fog. Um, I told Jim one of these days the trees will stop blooming and my sinuses will return to normal. Um, he said, yeah, just in time to get us ready for the next cycle. I said, yeah, that's kind of the way it is, but it's all right. Um, we were talking Wednesday night about that God has put eternity into our hearts, uh, yet so that he cannot find what God has done from the beginning to the end. So we were talking about that and talking about how most most religions worldwide, most societies, most people as a whole have some idea of or ideas about um, life after this life. And we talked about, you know, the... <clears throat> Different, different views that are out there, and I mean, there are, there are a lot of them. I mean, the idea of reincarnation, uh, enlightenment in some ways, ha in, in some of the philosophies has its uh, mind around the idea of a life after this life. Um, renovated earth, um, there are e there's even one group um, that believes that we will one day be gods and rule over our own world. Um, so, I mean, there are lots of different views about eternity. And I said on, on Wednesday that I think the reason that most people, most, most of mankind, thinks about life after this life and, and what is there, is there something, um, is this all there is, is because of this point that's made here in this text, that God has set eternity in our hearts, that he has essentially placed within us this longing or this thinking about something beyond this life, that we, we recognize as a people that there is a uniqueness between us and the animal world. And so um, we, we think about what's, what's going to be beyond this. And the second half of that, verse, I don't know, is a little more complicated, but my thought in, in reading those words is essentially that while there is within each of us this longing for or this belief that there exists something beyond this life, the truth is that we can't know anything really about it and about the truth of it without who? Without God. I mean, because, I mean, we're, we are limited to this life. Uh, we uh, we talk, we've talked about already in this class that there are concepts with regard to God and His nature and eternity and all those kinds of things that that we even though we can understand some things about it that God has revealed some things about it there are still aspects of that that are beyond our ability to really fully comprehend and understand and the reason for that is. <clears throat> Perhaps multitude, there are a multitude of reasons. One is we're not God. But the reality is we're also limited to the experiences of what we can see and observe here. Um, and so when we talk about, we, we've talked about eternity, for example. When we talk about forever and ever and this idea of eternity, we think, well, uh, you know, uh, Words like 10,000 years or, um, uh, as Greg said, even a lifetime seems like a really long, lengthy period of time for us. And so the idea of trying to grasp something that is forever and ever and never ends is difficult for us because everything we know here has a beginning and has an end. That's just the way it is. And so this, <clears throat> again, this idea of eternity unless God tells us something about it and gives us some clue as to what that's going to look like, there's no way for us to really grasp that and understand that and know those things of ourselves. And so God has put this seed of thought within us, and so we think about life after this life. But unless God tells us something about that, we can't really know what that's going to be like, what that entails. Um, <clears throat> and so God, God reveals those things to us and we do our best to grapple with the small amount that we've been given 
um, and, uh, and to deal with the idea of something that, that never ends um, from the perspective of people for whom that's a, a difficult concept to grasp. So heaven and hell, reincarnation, enlightenment, renovated earth, gods over our own worlds. So which is it and how do we know? Well, I mean, we, we know what God's revealed. That's all, that's all we can know. We, have, we, have, we, are, we are limited to gaining the information that we gain about the next life and about what is beyond here and now and life under the sun. We, we have to trust in the one who is eternal um, and has that knowledge, has that understanding, and so God has revealed to us. And so... It's not a question of what is it. <clears throat> um, if there is a God and if the Bible is his word, then there is a life after this life. And there is a, there is a time in which we're all going to give an account uh, before the, the judge of all the universe and the creator of everything. And then we will be separated as the sheep are from the goats. One, Some will go to the right and some to the left. Some into the eternal kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world and some into everlasting darkness away from the presence of God, um, which was reserved for his, the devil and his angels. So those are the options. Um, reincarnation, I don't know, some people, uh, I guess if you were reincarnated in a, in a, a better existence, that might be okay. But uh, I mean, Everybody wants to take some kind of comfort in the fact. What do we know about this life? What do all of us know about this life? It's what? We're, we'll surely die. What else do we know about this life, though, while we're alive? It's a roller coaster. It is a roller coaster. Um, <clears throat> and uh, hopefully none of us say it's awful <coughs> um, because we shouldn't think life is awful. But it's hard, isn't it? I mean, there are a lot of challenges in this life. And so we face these difficulties and challenges, and we all long for uh, being released from these challenges, being released from these trials, being released from this roller coaster, so that we can enjoy something better. And whether you're someone who believes in reincarnation and hopes that you'll come back, you know, if you've struggled through this life and done it well, maybe you'll come back in a better existence in the next life. But, but the point is, every one of them are longing for something better. And again, I think God put that within us. We, we, we long for a time when we can be released from all the struggle and can enjoy peace, the, the, the real peace in the sense of no more struggle. And so people come up with all of these different philosophies to explain it. God has the answer. The answer is an eternity with him um, where there is only goodness and no evil, no wickedness, no struggle, no, no, no difficulties that we face here, no death, no loss, um, none of those things that cause us the heartache and the pain and the struggle in this life and so God has told us what is available for us and has provided ultimately the means by which we can attain that and uh, so <clears throat> the key for us is to make sure we ultimately are in his favor and receive the reward that he is longing to give to all of us Anything else about God setting eternity in our hearts? I wish Andrew was here this morning because he was reading from uh, the Net Bible. He was telling us on Wednesday that he had been looking at that recently. And there was a difference in the translation in this particular verse that I, I found somewhat interesting. But um, they're, I, think they're, I think they're busy with news or something. Uh, I wanted to go see the baby. Anything else about that this section here? 
Okay, beginning in verse 16, and I didn't even put this in the questions, and I don't really know why. <clears throat> There's a statement made, though, here in this particular section in verse 16 and 17 that <clears throat> I think is one of the one of the issues that that people in general and even Christians sometimes, at least I know I've struggled with this. We struggle with this, with trying to grapple with and understand this point that's made here in this verse. And what is it? What's the point that he makes? <clears throat> he says in verse 16, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. So, you're asking what's the point? Well, I'm asking, what, 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 yeah, well, I mean, what's the main thing he's saying here? And why do we struggle with this concept and this point? I mean, is it true, number one? In the place of justice and goodness, is there sometimes wickedness? Yes. There might be a couple of ways of explaining it, but. Yes. I, I, I think you'll probably nail it. And, and it is, I mean, he, he make, he's making an observation here, and that's one of the things we talked about in the first classes, was a lot of what he draws from in this book is, is observational. It's things we can look at and see, oh, well, yeah, you're <laughs> right. I mean, this is supposed to be a, a court of justice, and it's been corrupted. Um, the, he, he shouldn't have done what he did to that good, just, righteous person. Um, and so we, we observe this. We observe it all the time. <clears throat> Greg says he doesn't, he's not in conflict with it. He, he just accepts it as how it is. What is the struggle that people have with it? And, and I still say sometimes even we as Christians. Is it because of the lack of knowledge? Yeah, I mean, it's, if, if there is a, and I, we talked about this in our last class with Andrew. A lot of people will say, well, if, if God is all-powerful and all-good, then, then what should happen to good people? Only good things, right? I mean, good people shouldn't be treated wickedly. We're, and we're, we're, we're not necessarily, well, I, although I think most people do when they say this, use this concept, but... We're not necessarily talking about the everyday activities. We're just talking about when bad people do bad things to good people or to righteous people or to God's people. We look at that and we think, well, you know, not only is that an injustice, that is a grave injustice. And, and surely God would step in and do something about that and, and stop that. And so we struggle with it. I, and again, I, I don't think it's just the world. We look at them and we say, well, that's just, I mean, that's the way the world is because, and so we, we kind of dismiss it. But I think <clears throat> at our core, there are times that we struggle with the same things. We see things that happen to people and we think, why in the world would that, something like that happen to them? Um, why, would, why would God permit that? Why, why wouldn't God take that away? <clears throat> but it is the nature of life under the sun, and a big part of it is what Greg said, and that is <coughs> that wicked men, um, well, man, man in general is the one that we're dealing with here. 
while we're under the sun, we, we have to deal with other people. And are most other people striving to be godly or no? No. I mean, the majority, it's always been the case. It's always been a remnant of people who have, have been striving to be faithful to God. Um, as Paul said in Romans chapter 9, not all Israel is Israel. And I know there are a couple different points that he's making there, but the point is, <clears throat> on, on the surface, when we, when we say Israel, talking about the Old Testament, who are we talking about? Who falls under the title of Israel? And don't, don't wax philosophical on me. Just let's be real general first. Who is Israel? Well, we could say God's people, but what, who, who were they? Where did the name come from? Okay, according to the promise, through whom? We're getting there. Okay, through Abraham. Well, Abraham had a lot of kids. Abraham. Isaac. And Jacob. And Jacob's the one that re was renamed ultimately Israel, right? So all of his descendants physically are who? They're Israel. Okay. But then we also said Israel is the people of God. Were all of those people who were physical descendants of Jacob Israel? No, they weren't. Why not? Because they weren't faithful to God. And so Paul makes a statement. Not all who are Israel are Israel. Um, and his point is just that just because you're physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob doesn't necessarily make you the people of God. <clears throat> and so people live the way they're going to live. And they, they, they sometimes are living in our midst and they will do horrible things to people who are striving to do what is right. And so we observe that. We understand that. That is the nature of life under the sun because God has permitted all of us are you glad to have free will? Most days. <laughs> uh, let's just be honest. Most days. You, you know, sometimes I think it would be much easier if God had just made me a puppet. But I would want to be one of the chosen ones who was the faithful that God uh, puppetized, not a word, into doing his will and walking the way he wants me to walk. <clears throat> but it doesn't work that way. God in his eternal wisdom, created us and then gave all of mankind free will. <clears throat> Which is a, a, a blessing and a curse. Because the reality is, what do most of us do with it? We squander it, we waste it, and we use it on our own devices and our own desires. And the end result is, who does that hurt? Okay, Samantha said... Well, it hurts us, which is true, it hurts other but then she also goes on to say it hurts other people. Yeah, and also it hurts God. Well, and that's, I mean, that's, the reality is we could start there. It hurts God first because he's the one that made us. And just like a parent that's disappointed when their children choose to go a way that is, is outside the way they ought to live, it hurts us. <clears throat> you know, when our kids are growing up, we say, we, we we used to give them a spanking, and I'm, I know I'm not the only parent who said, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And the kid's like, yeah, right. <laughs> sure it is. I mean, it's, gonna, it's going to hurt them physically, but it hurts us uh, emotionally to have to do those things in order to train them to understand the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. <clears throat> and so... It hurts everybody. Ultimately, Adam and Eve's choice to follow their own selfish desires hurt all of us because the world was cursed because of the sin that they committed in the garden. And so there have been a long line of consequences that have existed because of that choice. And the reality is we look at that and we say, well, that's awful. Is there a long 
line of consequences for the sinful choices I make? Yeah. I may not be able to trace it quite as far back, but the reality is there's a long line of consequences for the, ch- for the sinful choices that I make. For me, for those who are closest to me, um, for those whose lives I have the opportunity to influence and impact, um, <clears throat> it, it creates a host of consequences. But people, people, Steve, Steve Wolfgang used to, his, his first rule of human behavior is people will do what they want to do. And that's true. People will do what they want to do. Um, and unfortunately, most of them don't want to do what God wants. And so the end result is that where there's supposed to be justice, instead there's wickedness. And where there's supposed to be righteousness and where you would, would hope to find it. I mean, this was Habakkuk's struggle in his day. I mean, he was living among the people of God, and yet there were wicked people among them, not Babylonians or Assyrians or Canaanites. There were wicked people among them who were Israelites, who were mistreating and acting wickedly <clears throat> in, in that very nation. And he's like, well, when are you going to deal with this? How can you let these people just thumb their nose at you? You've given them all these great blessings, and you're just letting them live this way, and we're having to suffer because of it. And God says, I'm going to deal with it. You're not going to like it. Yes, sir. Well, you see, that happen with people. <coughs> Yes, and I mean, that, that, that happens all the time. Israel is not unique. <clears throat> there is nothing new under the sun. See what has already been. Uh, that which is already has been, verse 15. And that which is to be already has been. Um, so that, there's nothing new under the sun, chapter 1. <clears throat> this is the nature of the world that we live in, and it... it, it it really shouldn't surprise us because this is this is the way it's been for millennia, and it will continue as long as men exist. Um, because we rebel against God, we make wicked choices, and those wicked choices, unfortunately, sometimes impact righteous people who are striving to do the will of God. <clears throat> so, um, it is a reality. But it doesn't necessarily mean it makes makes it any easier for us to accept. I mean, the reality is, could God step in? Has he? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, we say he can step in. I mean, and so, you know, to the, to the people of the world, that may seem like just a kind of a cop-out. Well, he could step in any time he wanted to because uh, he's all-powerful and because he's good. And they think, well, yeah, that's convenient for you to say he could step in, but he doesn't. <clears throat> but the reality is, I asked the second question, has he? And the, the truth is, yes. There have been occasions in the past where God has stepped in and, and done something about the wickedness or done something about the sickness. I mean, Jesus was here for 30 years and for three and a half years ministered to people. Um, And so there were people who were born blind that regained their sight. There were people who died and and their their, their loved ones regained the the individual because Jesus raised them from the dead. So there have been times in the past where God stepped in. And so the struggle for us is, right? The struggle for us is when we see things and God doesn't step in, what do we think? That's right. We ask the question, why? And the, the reality is, the answer is we don't know. And the truth is, <clears throat> among all those people who were in Palestine during the first century when Jesus was walking the earth, um, <clears throat> do you think that the guy in John chapter 9 that Jesus gave his sight to, the man who was born blind, do you think he was the only man born blind in Palestine in Jesus' day? The widow of Nain's son who died and Jesus resurrected him or Lazarus, were they the only people that died during Jesus' lifetime? No. 
So, so did Jesus step in and, and raise everyone who died during that time? Did he give sight to everyone who was blind? Did he heal every leper? No. And so God has done that on occasions throughout history. Were there, was there a specific purpose to what Jesus was doing during those times that he was healing those people? Yes, and there were occasions where he healed a multitude of people all at the same time. I mean, we see occasions like that. But the point is, he didn't heal everybody. Why not? Yes, ma'am. Okay, he was, the, he, the things that he did, he was doing as a confirmation, a verification of who he is and what he was teaching and all of those things. Why didn't he heal everybody? That lived during his day. <clears throat> okay. Okay. But we, uh, I mean, uh, just in answer to that, we have some instances where Jesus didn't even have to go to their house right. or be in the room with them. Why? I, I, I'm, I, this, uh, I'm kind of pushing a point here. Why didn't Jesus heal everyone? Because that wasn't his purpose. That's exactly it. Because that was not his purpose. Um, and, and, and part of our issue as people in general, but sometimes even as Christians, is we are way too attached to here. We, we have gotten way, we have grown way too affectionate for this life and don't long enough for the life to come. And so everything is about being happy and satisfied and at peace here. Has that ever been God's aim for us? Absolutely not. This life and we sing, this world is not my home. Do we believe that? Because we, we, we sometimes don't act like it. This life is not what we're longing for. This life is not, is not the end all. There is a great place waiting for us where there is peace and security and no pain and no suffering and no sorrow and all those great things. But is that here? No. So um, I'm back to sounding like Solomon saying this life is just miserable and let's get on with it already. I mean, but is that the point? Are there things here to enjoy? What, what are every one of those great blessings? What are they? In the words of this book and James chapter 1 and lots of other places. Everything in this life that's worth enjoying is what? It's temporal. It is a gift from God. That is the key to this entire book, is the recognition of the fact. Now, <clears throat> everything that is, a, is truly a blessing, I guess I should kind of put a disclaimer on my statement. I said everything that's, that brings joy or enjoyment. Um, the reality is some of the things Solomon was talking about here in this book that bring enjoyment are not necessarily a gift, of, a gift from God. But the things of this life that are truly a blessing and worth having and worth enjoying, those are all a gift from God. <clears throat> the, the problem is if that's all we ever had, what would this be, in essence? If I never had to suffer... Yeah, I mean, why would there be a longing for anything better? I mean, it's, uh, this, is, this is good. I mean, there's a sense in which if I never suffered here and all I had were good things, what would this be? It would be heaven. But this is not heaven. This is not the presence of God. Wickedness still exists. And, and a part of that 
being allowed to continue is a reminder of the fact that this is not what we're after. This is not the this is not what we're ultimately longing for. Oh yeah, good things. We enjoy it. It's like going on vacation. We enjoy going on vacation. Um, and and so we en- we enjoy those times, but we're longing for something better. How, how many of you would like a permanent vacation? That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? <clears throat> well, there's there there is a home waiting for us where there is nothing bad, only good. And again, we can't really fully grasp that, Jim. Yeah, there. I mean, there are occasions where the reason we're suffering is because I did something stupid. Um, I, it's happened to me a lot in my lifetime, um, and and so God, as a good parent does, will allow His children to suffer on occasions because it's for their good. It, it is it is discipline, um, allowing them to face the consequences, to face the music for their choices. Uh, can be helpful in teaching lessons uh, for them. Um, and then the other thing is, we talked about this a little bit, <clears throat> I think also in Andrew's class, is if God stepped in every time a Christian took a misstep or somebody was going to hurt us, what ultimately would happen to the world at large? I want you to think about that a little bit. This is a little more of a philosophical question, but it's... The, the, yeah, f- for one, the question of free will would be a lot fuzzier. Um, <clears throat> for example, we talked about concepts like uh, gravity and things like that. What if I slip on a building and I like slipped over the edge and God just suspended gravity? He decided, well, I'm not going to let you fall because you're one of my children and you're striving to faithfully follow me. And so... I'm just going to catch you, and you, you know you've seen you've seen the cartoons, right? Bugs Bunny and Wile E. Coyote chasing the Road Runner, and he runs off the cliff. And what happens when he runs off the cliff? He just floats there for a couple seconds, right? Till he figures out that he's over thin air, and then he falls. What if God did that, and I, you know, I slip off the building, and God just kind of caught me in the hands, and then let me get back up and climb back on the building? <coughs> then suddenly, what happens to the world? that we live in that we feel is very predictable. I mean, I know that if I walk off the the ledge of a roof, what's going to happen? I'm going to fall. Why? Because gravity is a certainty, (coughs) right? But if God just stepped in every time one of his people took a misstep, I'm not talking about when they sin. I'm talking about, you know, I just, I slipped on the roof. And was going to fall off and God catches me. If, if God stepped in and did that every time, what happens to the world? It becomes chaotic and we can't make sense of things because, well, I mean, I, we know that this is supposed to happen when you step off a roof. And yet it didn't happen in this case. And so it's and then just like Israel did and we do, too, we begin to take for granted. Well, uh, you know, I don't have to worry too much about being careful because God will just step in and make sure I'm taken care of. And so we begin to to try to game the system and use those blessings and have God, you know, and we would even use justification for it and say, well, I just wanted God to be able to demonstrate his power so that maybe somebody would believe. And so we would make justifications like that and, and nothing would make any sense. So God allows a lot of things to happen in the world that he doesn't cause, that he doesn't will, um, that he wished weren't happening because he has granted us the freedom to make choices. And so we've got to grapple with that and wrestle with the reality of this statement in verse 16 while recognizing the goodness and faithfulness of God and the fact that he has promised us something better that's not here, will God deal with wickedness? Will wicked people get away with it forever? No. Again, how do I know that? Because it sure seems like it. 
Well, 17, I mean, the Bible as a whole, right? God, God's going to deal with wickedness. Um, but in the meantime, he's giving, he, he's demonstrating patience and long suffering so that some of those people might come to a knowledge of the truth and, and be saved. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> right. And we'd, we'd have it here. We, we wouldn't need anything else. Nope. So the struggles we face here remind us that this is not this is not it. This is not what we're longing for. There's, there's something better. Okay, what does it mean that God tests us that we may see that we are like animals? That sounds odd. Well, my part sounds odd is exactly the part that's true. Right? Yeah. That we're like, uh, I have put animals. The English Standard Version says that they themselves are but beasts. <clears throat> are we animals? From a scientific point of view, the answer is yes. Um, we are a part of the animal kingdom. We are under... But, a, unlike, but unlike the pedigree, that is, I, I know what I'm thinking, pedigree, I have to say it too. <coughs> Come back to me, I, I know okay. what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, uh, from, from a scientific point of view, we are animals. What do we have in common with animals? What? Okay, we all die. That's one of the things that he mentions here. We all have the same breath. Um, and so ultimately we all die. That is common, a common feature. What are some, I mean, what are other similarities? I mean, this is, this is the thing when we start talking about creation and evolution. There, there's a, one of the things that evolutionists use, one of the arguments, the piece of evidence they use, is something called comparative anatomy. And so the idea is that the more similar two animals are, the more likely they are to have descended from one another or have evolved from the same common ancestor. And so, for example, you go to the zoo and watch the little colobus monkeys and other monkeys jumping around in the trees and picking stuff off of each other and playing their games, what do you think when you look at them? Come on, I'm not, I can't be the only person who's looked at, a, looked at a monkey playing and thought, they look like what? They look like fuzzy people. I mean, they just look like fuzzy people. I mean, they do the same kinds of things that our kids do when they're, not, not that kids are monkeys, they can be, um, but they, I mean, they do some of the same kinds of stuff. They, they, they pick at each other and they run from each other and they, they have all kinds of, and, and some of them even have these little faces that are hairless and you look at them and it's like, oh, he looks like a little old man. <laughs> and so, I mean, we do that kind of stuff. We look at their similarities and, and evolutionists look at that and say, well, we obviously have evolved from the same ancestor as the primates have because we have a lot of similar features. We have um, <clears throat> thumbs and the ability to grasp things and do all of that kind of stuff. And so they look at that and say those similarities describe um, or, 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 or are evidence that we have evolved from the same ancestor. We are, we are beasts in the sense that we have, what, what, do, what do all beasts have? What are some common features that all of us have? Right. And, and what do we see on the news every night? We, we have the four or five kids that fell out of the hill. We do. When we serve our own selfish desires, are we really any more sophisticated? No. I mean, our purposes and our what, what we're trying to get at, what we're trying to get is it may be different. 
but ultimately it's it's still self-serving and we can be just as vile and as they are yes i finally figured out what i was trying to say okay i think the difference is the tools because some people have the ability to do things okay yeah i mean we talked about this in the study with andrew there are a number of different things that distinguish us from every other animal but there are a whole lot of things that are very similar to animals i mean we talked about some of the similarities between digits with primates um If you cut open an animal, I don't care if it's a horse, a lion, or a monkey, what are you going to find inside its chest? A heart. What are you going to find inside its head? A brain. You got one of those? I got a brain. I got a heart. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes we don't use them very well. You're going to find lungs. You're going to find digestive systems. You're going to find all of those things. And so we have those features too. And so from a physical point of view, what are we? We're animals. What makes us different? I think the ability to reason is one thing. Uh, that, well, it's definitely one of them, but it all co- co- the, whatever reason we give go, goes back to what? Distinguishing feature. Okay. He's saying that we are animals in all respects, but except. we have that God has bestowed in the Son. Okay, so there's that aspect of, of eternity, but but go back to the very beginning. Why? What distinguishes us from every other animal on the face of this planet? We we, we were created by God in His image, and so that makes us unique, <laughs> and. It is the reason why, as Greg said, we have eternity in our hearts and we think about something beyond this life. And so there is a part of us, even though we're like animals in the sense that just like they die, we die. There is something beyond that. He makes a statement here that I want us to talk about a little bit at the beginning of Wednesday um, in verse 21. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I want to talk about that just a little bit. <clears throat> and then we'll move into chapter 4. Thank you all for your help this morning, and uh, still looking for a couple of people to be willing to teach. Um, Wednesday, May, is it May 1st? 1st, 8th, and 5th, I think. 4th. 4th. 5th.